We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. All right, right time. You know, we started here now, and uh, we can we can we can start. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful wonderful panel of experts I mean, in AI ethics joining us, and thanks for audiences. And feel free to join us anytime. And uh, when we design this topic back in uh, last year, AI ethics and the internet governance, global lessons and practice. We did not expect AI ethic became such an uh, important and uh, you know critical area, like and you know people uh, will have an interest in um, online and we have a lot of more people who are joining us, uh, you know here. Without further ado, and I will next the first speaker and you know come to tell us and share, and his ideas about intelligence media use in China challenges and implication. Let's welcome Professor Lu Wei and the Dean of College of Media and the International Culture of Zhejiang University. Thank you so much, Professor Zhang. Uh, it's a great pleasure to meet all the old friends and new friends of the internet. Uh, well, since I have only five minutes, so I would like to uh, very briefly report uh, some key findings of uh, our study about intelligent media use in China. Uh, so basically we found that China has entered uh, intelligent media age uh, since last year, because according to our survey, uh, more than half of the respondents have used intelligent media to receive news. And they also spend uh, more than 1000 RMB on uh, intelligent media products. Uh, and second, we found uh, intelligent divide is emerging. Uh, we found that the use of intelligent media differs uh, among different age groups, uh, educational levels, uh, income levels, and also urban rural backgrounds. Uh, so we can uh, conclude that uh, intelligent divide has become a new form of digital divide. And third, um, according to our survey, uh, AI technology is not a panacea for media industry. Uh, rather than enhancing the content features of journalism, AI has stronger impact on the forms. And fourth, uh, three risks deserve more scholarly attention. Uh, the first and the most uh, important concern from our respondents is uh, the concern of uh, the so-called information cocoons or filter bubbles. And privacy invasion and also uh, value erosion uh, were perceived as challenges as well. So uh, based on these key findings, uh, I think we can uh, make some suggestions for uh, government, for media, and for individuals. Uh, so for the government, we think uh, the governments need to enhance AI governance uh, by law, uh, by ethics, and also by new technology. For example, uh, this September, Chinese government has established a new law uh, about uh, data security. So I think uh, the, the law may be uh, one of the most important measures we should take uh, to guarantee uh, the reasonable development of AI technology. Uh, and second, we think uh, for the media, uh, the, the, uh, the professional journalism, uh, the media people, they should maintain a uh, humanistic value. Uh, for example, we don't think uh, AI technology uh, should replace human, but also, uh, well, actually they should empower human. Uh, and uh, the media people, they should pay more attention on the quality of information rather than on the quantity of information. And also, generally speaking, mass media, uh, if, uh, also the uh, intelligent media, they should uh, show stronger social responsibility in the content uh, production and also the design of new products. And finally, uh, we believe that the general, the general public should seek uh, more reasonable behavior uh, for example, individuals, they need to enhance intelligent media literacy, including 
uh, knowledge, including uh, skills and also critical ability uh, about their intelligent media use. And also the individuals, they need to reduce uh, technology dependence. Uh, well, technology is good because they facilitate a lot of things uh, in our daily lives, but we should not uh, over dependent on new technology. And, and finally, we think uh, the general users, they should fight against overconnection. Uh, by internet connection, we can uh, make the whole world uh, become a global village, but also we uh, need to keep something offline. So uh, we should not move everything online. We should leave a blank in the process of digitalization. Uh, so that's basically some of the suggestions and implications uh, we have from uh, our study about the uh, intelligent media use in China. Uh, so that's uh, what I have to say right now. Uh, I welcome any feedbacks and questions later. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Thank you, Professor Wei. And, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's really good. And, you know, we here at IGF, we do not use, and uh, mostly we do not use uh, the PowerPoint. And, uh, you know, sure. Professor <laughs> Wei always- yeah, like I think that's better. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, um, you know, PowerPoint that only I could say. But I really I share and you know your your concern and your your wishes here. Okay, that's that's so great. Let's move on to the next speaker, which has come from Canada, Professor Matthew Guten and Professor and Secretary of the Faculty of Medicine uh, from University Laval, Canada. Uh, that's in Quebec. How about let's and you know see his and recorded video. May I please uh, share your screen? including the audio, please. No, no audio. Can you, can you reshare again? Can you hear that? No. You, you need to share and then let me do that. Let me take, take control of this. Yuan, can you stop sharing? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to share and his uh, his talk. Hello everybody, my name is Mathieu Guitton and I'm a professor at University Laval in Quebec City in Canada. Uh, first, I want to say that I'm very honored to be here with you today and I want to thank Professor Buizong for his invitation to participate in this workshop. Uh, I will be talking briefly, just a few minutes, about the problem of status and rights of artificial intelligence and how it relates to questions of ethics and governance. I will mostly be asking questions today rather than providing answers, because what we have to do now is to further the debate and the discussion. So one of the fundamental issues, uh, if we consider the possible and likely future impact of artificial intelligence on governance and all the related ethical issues that are likely to arise from that, is the very question of what will be the nature we are ready to grant to artificial intelligence in plural, because there is not one kind of artificial intelligence. There can be several types of artificial intelligence or artificial agents which have some degree of uh, autonomy similar to what we understand as human intelligence. What I mean by that is what will be the status of artificial intelligence, what will be their degree of autonomy that we allow them to have and that we acknowledge them to have. And that is very important. It's, it is really what we acknowledge in terms of status. And related to that, what will be their responsibility, their accountability, and ultimately their rights? In other words, do we want artificial intelligence to be mere tools? Very complex, very powerful tools. I, I don't say they are not powerful very powerful tool, but still tools. And in this case, what is the amount of our own freedom that we are uh, ready to, to, go, to let go in the quote-unquote hands 
of artificial, even if somehow, and especially if somehow autonomous tools, or do we want artificial intelligence to become partners instead of tools, which will mean at some point granting them rights like human rights or artificial human rights and putting ourselves in a frame of mind that would ultimately allow us to have a dialogue between human and artificial intelligence. In other words, to approach artificial intelligence in a way that might result in the rise of artificial humans, at least in terms of ethics, status, and rights. And I will finish with that, uh, as I believe it does provide some ground and some futurologic context for all the other questions that the other panelists will bring up in this workshop. So really, what will be the status and the right that we will give to artificial intelligence? And as a result of that, will they remain tool or will they become partners? Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, and uh, that's our uh, uh, you know second speaker, and who are, came from Canada. I do share and his concern. We actually have like more questions and answers than you know talking about AI. Um, so next, and we'll invite uh, you know Penn State professor Amit Sharma, who is also um, who is also our you know the director of our food security uh, research, food decision research laboratory at Pennsylvania State University. And he'll tell us uh, that his title is uh, Technology Transparency and Informed Choices in Food and Agriculture for Sustainable Development. Professor Shamar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Um, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, uh, as you uh, uh, included in, in the title, I'm our area of research is in food and agriculture, uh, particularly in the food service system is what we call uh, food away from home, as you all are might be aware, uh, that has increased tremendously around the world. In the United States, uh, food away from home prior to COVID-19 was more than the food, uh, the money we spent on food at home. Um, there are similar trends around the world. So the importance of how we behave, how we act in that food environment that's outside of the home is extremely important. Uh, recently, uh, my colleagues and I, we did a paper on the ethics in the food service system and basing, uh, basing our discussion on uh, MIFAM's model, uh, which, in, which essentially looked at three aspects of uh, ethics, autonomy, justice, and well-being. Um, and what I want to share with you today is in the context of uh, autonomy. Um, AI obviously has been extremely valuable for both the consumer as well as the, the firms. Um, so for instance, uh, AI technologies such as smart, uh, uh, smart assistants, bots, natural languages, uh, they can be very helpful. Um, so uh, case in point, uh, you pick up an app and you want to order food. Um, the, this, uh, the process has become extremely convenient. Um, it reduces uh, a lot of the effort cost uh, aspects on the consumer and it makes it very convenient. However, they are obviously uh, concerns. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the other things on the supply side or the pro provider side is repetitive tasks. Um, as you are aware that there is a huge labor shortage that we are facing. Um, and and we, we really need to relook at some of these job profiles. So uh, AI can help in that redu reduction of the repetitive jobs so that we can elevate the, the, the competency levels of the jobs that we really need uh, to, for value added. The concerns that uh, I wanna share with you in context of autonomy is, uh, uh, the, uh, is exactly what the topic of the discussion is choice. Um, so what, what AI does is it reduces the choice uh, set. Um, literally. Um, and that can be, uh, so subtle guidance to some level is good, uh, but a repetitive subtle guidance can guide us in one particular uh, uh, um, um, in one particular direction. So one of the things that we talk about a lot in the paper um, is the, the idea of nudges. Uh, that's a, 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 more, a more paternalistic approach um, to decide, you know, for someone else to decide uh, on what you um, would like to, what, what you would like to prefer or choose. Um, so uh, on the consumer end, we, we certainly think that there is this um, uh, ethical issue related to 
the, the nudges. On the supply or the offer side, um, uh, the, most of the industry is around small businesses. One of the biggest challenges with small businesses is availability of resources and finances. And so they're not really at a, a level playing field with larger businesses to be able to take advantage of new technologies such as AI. So um, in, in terms of interventions, we believe that at least there has to be a level of transparency, whether it is on the consumer side, uh, the user side, uh, in terms of how they can continue to expand that or, or maintain that choice set. Um, the, uh, and on the, on the offer side, uh, we think the interventions are necessary um, for not just uh, helping our rest owners, small owners particularly, understand the value of AI, how they can leverage it to increase efficiencies, increase margins, uh, but also have the resources to be able to invest in those. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, along those lines for both, I think what's, what we talked about is education. Um, it's necessary to ask the questions that, that where are we when it comes to our autonomy of choice? Uh, thank you, Dr. Zhang. Doc thank you, Dr. Zhang. Thank you, Professor Sharma. You know, I want to talk to the uh, on-site and the participants and uh, at IGF, they're welcome. Thank you for coming. And AI ethics is actually a very important topic here. We are very honored to invite a panel of seven experts and come from different areas or area. So I will talk about AI ethics. The timing is not very good, except you know, you, you folks on site is good. And for us in the uh, Eastern time in the United States is very early in the morning and uh, Professor Sharma and also Laura and um, Renata and you got up so early, I appreciate that. But in the Beijing side and that's and, you know, in the evening and thank you for joining us and you know, immediately come and you know, out of your dinner and enjoy us. But anyway, and we welcome you uh, for those and on site there and you have more advantages than us and you know, to do. Our next speaker is Lola Xie and she's a doctor student you know, um, from China and at Pennsylvania State University uh, in the United States. And her title is Algorithm Transparency Influences People's Use of Social Media for Health Information. Lola, please. Hi, um, thank you, Dr. Zhong. It's an honor to be here. So hi everyone, my name is Lola and I'm a PhD candidate at Penn State University. So I study people's use of information and communication technologies for personal health management, especially those with chronic mental health conditions, such as opioid addiction, depression, and eating disorders. So today I'll be briefly share some of my experiences working with a very specific form of artificial intelligence, which is the algorithm we use on social media. So in my scientific inquiry, one question I always ask is how people use social media to acquire health information they need and how information online can help them achieve better health outcomes. So if you have ever tried to search any health related information online in the past couple of years, you'll be able to see the changes in the way we present and communicate health information online over time. So in the past, we had to actually proactively search for health information about a specific disease or condition and collect different pieces of information from different websites. But with the advancement of technology and media technologies today, when you search for a very specific condition online, you will be able to see a synthesized overview of the condition, telling you the symptoms, the causes, the treatments, and ways you can seek professional help at just one click. And moreover, if you search for the condition on a major social media platforms, you will be able to find millions of posts about it from other users, and you will also find the access to information from credible sources such as WHO, CDC, or NIH in just one second. And that's the case for COVID. If you just search for COVID-19 on either Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, you will be directed to CDC's website and NIH's website about the disease and then tell you what to do. So artificial intelligence, in another word, algorithm is behind all these. In my specific research area, algorithm also help communicating very sensitive health messages to people who those messages can be very triggering to them. For example, we now have algorithms that help detect risky languages used in users' posts on social media regarding eating disorder. So 
whenever the language glorifying or promoting eating disorders on social media is detected, a trained AI will put a red flag on the post, evaluate the post, and further make the decision to either take down the post or incorporate a, incorporate a little trigger warning flag in the post for other users. So the algorithm will also make pro eating disorder recovery content and help seeking information more visible to other users while um, make pro eating disorder content less visible on the platform. While this type of algorithm can actually largely help combat misinformation and reducing pro eating disorder content, it also raises some technological and ethical concerns over the years. So one issue is about the accuracy of the algorithm that we're using today. So past research has suggested that there's a very blurry line between pro-eating disorder content and pro-eating disorder recovery content on social media, making it extremely difficult for AI to differentiate recovery content from pro-eating disorder content. And also in our society at the same time, major social media platforms, they're very slow and reluctant to adopt a new algorithm to help detect these kind of health risks and languages on social media. And because pro-eating disorder content, pro-dieting culture content can actually bring them more traffic and profits at the end of the day. So this often resulted in pro-recovery content being falsely flagged and deleted while pro-eating disorder content stays under the spotlight. So in a recent research project that I did with my uh, colleague from University of British Columbia, we actually interviewed social media content creators who post their eating disorder recoveries online. And what we realized from them is that they have a major complaint about how algorithm on social media today often make their recovery content less visible. And um, while they are also promoting content that perpetuates ideal body image and extreme diets. And it's not just the case of eating disorders, but also for many other health related information online, such as opioid crisis, the COVID-19 and many other health um, conditions. So as users, we need to know more about the algorithm deciding what we see and not see on social media, especially when it comes to important health information. And that's why as researchers, we need to not only make our algorithm more accurate in detecting potential risks involved in user-generated content on social media, but also make the process more transparent to the public, letting them know what we're doing to help them um, to achieve better health outcomes. Outcomes. And at the same time, we also need major social media platforms, those all big tech companies to be more transparent about their algorithm, explaining how they prioritize certain information over the others when presenting health information and reconstruct their algorithm to actually serve the public good. So that's everything I have to say. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, and you know, for, uh, Lola Ashe. Um, to the audiences and on the side, we have two more speakers, and then we'll open the um, uh, our forums, you know, uh, with you and go to the Q and A. Our next speaker is a distinguished professor uh, from Zhejiang University, um, and also and a very well known and you know uh, internet uh, researcher uh, from China. And currently, and he is a distinguished professor from College of Media and International Culture, Zhejiang University, Professor Fang Xingdong. Please. Uh,这个主题我觉得我们也一直这个这个努力了很长时间，因为我觉得在新冠疫情下，我觉得全球数字治理进入了一个新的阶段，是吧？直接跟我们美国人的日常生活和切身利益都密切相关。而且我们我
制制那个制度，我觉得可能是关键所在。因为 AI 伦理的问题的核心，它还是数据，数据的秩序和数据的使用的基本规则，是吧？怎么怎么能够取得全球的共识？那过去曾经呢，就中国在个人信息保护和数据保护方面是相对比较薄弱的，但是这几年中国已经在在奋起直追了。就是这个政府、学术界、产业界，已经形成了良好的这个协同推进的局面。就一方面，我们的制度建设在很快的这个推进；另一方面，我觉得中国在这方面，就是说能够开放式的学习。比如说，欧盟的数字市场法，目前还处在草案阶段，但是其中最核心的这个守门人的理念，实际上已经快速的落实到中国已经已经生效的个人信息保护法和数据安全法。啊，同时，中国在这过去的两年里头，就是不仅发起了全球数据安全倡议。还申请加入 CPTPP 和 DEPA 等等，就国际国际这个这个这个架构，是吧？说明了我们在数据这块的未来的治理的这个开放，这个这个开放的态势。所以过去四十年，我觉得中国用一种开放式的态度来学习美国的科技创新。那现在，我觉得中国也会开放式的来学习像欧洲的这个这些，就说制度创新比较比较先进的这个区域。那制度作为一种重要的公共物品，我觉得。各国相互学习，更大程度的互联互通，我觉得非常重要。所以 ，A R 伦理和 A R 治理，是我们需要更紧密的联起手来，从沟通沟通的共识到制度的共建，是构建新的机制，可能可能是越来越重要。好，我我大概就就这一这一个这些观点。好，谢谢大家。Okay, thanks and Miss, uh, Miss Yuan Yuan Fan, and you can you uh interpret and what he he talked to us. Okay, I will br briefly uh, translate what Dr. Wong has been said. Uh, because of the uh, COVID-19, global digital governance enters a brand new stage, which directly related to every person's daily life and the personal interests. We are pleased to see that in the past two years, in the face, uh, in the face of multiple layered challenges raised by super platforms. China, the United States, and Europe have achieved a rare passage understanding uh, in the history of the internet in terms of anti-monopoly and internet governance, uh, which indicates that in the digital era, there is a greater need for global connectivity and cooperation, in addition to establishing good communication uh, mechanisms, countries need closer institutional exchanges and learnings from each other and the co-construction in digital governance. While well, the progress has been made in antitrust and platform governance, the deeper and greater challenges is to build a global consensus on AI ethics and to establish a set of binding and globally interconnected AI governance systems. The core AI ethical issue is data, the order of data, and the basic rules of data usage. In the past, China has relatively weak in terms of personal information and the data protection, but it has been catching up in the past few years. The government, academia, and industry have formed a good cooperation to promote to promote the situation. On the one hand, institutional development have has been accelerated, and on the other hand, learning with open mind open minded. For example, the EU digital marketplace law is still in draft stage, but the core concept of gatekeeper has been implemented into China's personal information protection law and data security law which have already been implemented. In the meantime, China has not only launched the global in initiative on data security, but also applied to join CPPPP and Digital Economy Partnership Agreement. Over the past 40 years, China has openly la learned from America in technology, and now China will also openly learn from European institutional innovations. Institutions are an important public good. It is necessary to learn from each other and keep inter interconnected. As for AI ethics and uh, AI governance, it is crucial for us to closely work together and build new 
mechanisms from communication con consensus to institutional co-construction. Con co Thank you. Thank you very much, and Fan, uh, for translating this. I think I, I do share like kind of Professor Fan's talking, and he's uh, the really believe and uh, we use AI ethics fundamentally, and we need to pay attention to how we're going to make good use of the data we have. Uh, the capability of process those data extremely essential for us to make an uh, AI ethics and uh, you know transparent. Also, and uh, I, I also share Fan's and you know talk about. Um, we need a joint effort. You know, in this today's world, we really need joint efforts in terms of like and tackling AI ethics issues, dilemma, and benefits together. Um, Europe, like and you know, uh, east to west, basically, and jointly, and we'll work on this. Uh, next, we're going to our um, last speaker today, and we actually have a speaker from Brazil, from like and Bulgaria, from United States, obviously from China and also from Canada. And uh, uh, now we go to Renata Carlos Dow. And she's a you know, international student from Brazil. And uh, her title is How AI Can Cause like, Inequality and Biases. Go ahead, and, uh, you know, Professor Carlos Dow. Hey, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so one of like the main issues involving um, the ethics of artificial intelligence involves um, inequality. So in the way that the world is structured today, um, our economic system is based on hourly wage, which means that people are paid by hour to do their job. So, but um, however, as the World Economic Forum points out, um, with the devel development of artificial intelligence, uh, companies can cut down the workforce and rely on fewer people. So as the Harvard Gazette stated, um, artificial intelligence uh, has crossed many fields like healthcare, banking, retail, manufacturing, and these softwares can improve efficiency, reduce costs, and accelerate um, research, for example. So the companies that have the capital to invest in these IA systems, they have an advantage comparing to companies that still rely on human workforce. So these companies um, have a kickstart. We'll be making more money, which will heighten like inequality. So the price of artificial intelligence um, varies. So um, as prototype um, development starts around like $2,000 and the cost of implementing IA solutions can cost up to a million dollars depending on um, performance, the complexity of the software and many other factors. But um, that means that not every business, especially those are starting like with personal funds or like small business, they cannot afford to make such uh, big investments. Uh, so they still rely on human workforce. So another ethical issue related to uh, artificial intelligence revolves around humanity. So machines have a hard time detecting people's emotions and they do not possess like human um, characteristics like empathy. So um, UNESCO actually proposed um, an ethical dilemma that dealt with um, artificial intelligence and decision-making. So the example revolved around like an autonomous car. So it was very similar with um, Philippa Putz, the trolley problem. So if an autonomous car was going in full speed in the direction of a child and a senior, and by deviating a little, um, one person could be saved, we would need to rely on the car's algorithm to decide. So the decision would also be linked to another ethical problem, like, um, for example, like racist problems. So the World Economic Forum also mentions that some missed marks um, racial sensitive or the algorithm can create biased um, artificial intelligence softwares. So in a situation like the automated car, this can result in a life or death situation. So when employing um, artificial intelligence softwares, companies must think beyond like cost, just cost and agility. So um, as the Harvard Gazette says, if used correctly, um, artificial intelligence can for example, 
create a bigger pool of job applicants, for example, since it would minimize um, human favoritism. However, if not applied correctly, um, those softwares can just um, replicate uh, already existing human biases. So when applying um, artificial intelligence, all of those ethical considerations need to be went into to ensure that biases are not employed. So yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Renata. I mean, you know, I appreciate that you're uh, sharing about those and the biases. Now we're ready to open the floor to the um, uh, on-site and the participants here. Uh, I want to just uh, very briefly remind any of all of us, artificial intelligence indeed is ushering a world in which human decisions are made in primarily three ways. Number one is by humans, which is we're very familiar with. The second one is by machines, which is become familiar to us. And art is by collaborations between human and the machine, which is not so familiar with us, but never happened before because, so AI actually promises to transform all aspects of human experiences. And the core of this transformation will ultimately occur at the philosophical level, transforming how humans understand reality and our role within the relationship between machine and humans. So you, we know that only very rarely have we encountered a technology like AI challenge our prevailing modes of explaining and ordering the world. The evolution of AI is affecting human perception, cognition, and interactions. What will it, an AI's impact be our culture? be our concept of humanity, be our human history. And today, like we teased us and about morality. So my fundamental question, when we ask these questions there is, who can teach morality or ethics to machines? AI researcher, you know, philosophers, you know, big tech companies or government officials, regulators, we don't know. You know, that's why we're here and, you know, discuss this kind of um, AI ethics. Now I'm open to the floor and uh, please, and, you know, raise your question. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know and how IGF handles this and on site there, and we don't have anyone, you know, on the site. And, you know, we, how can we, we any questions are from the, um, come on the site. Anyone from down the side and have a question was, Participants with comments, please use the standing mic. Yeah. yeah, please use the standing mics if you want. Anyone? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, hi. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Hi. I'm, yeah. I'm... Very good. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> I'm. I'm... I'm Jose. I'm from I'm from Mexico. I so first of all, congratulations to all of your interventions. They were really really fascinating. I wanted to ask each one of you like several different questions, but I think a general question would be kind of like for the debate. My, my, my question is a little bit on, I, I uh, so AI. We've talked about on how it impacts very different sectors and different, uh, uh, yeah, like uh, economic activities. I wanted to to ask you about how AI is also will increase. Uh, inequality uh, between countries as more industrialized uh, nations have more ability to develop this technology and not only that but to make better use for example of data so how data how data flows happen where you can take data from one country but other countries have a better ability to use it because they have better technology and in general the development of AI technology it will increase eventually even further the inequality between countries as a general. So I wanted to hear on which from all of you or whoever has a take on this, on how do you see this, this coming uh, in, the, in, the next, uh, in the next years? Thank you. That's a very good question, Jose. Thank you so much. And you know, his question basically, uh, you know, say how AI can help like the international relations or how people or how AI may help and improve relations between countries. And um, I think, and you also indicate like how AI may like, and you know, uh, help us um, jointly make better use of data available. Any of our panel uh, like to address this question?
Professor Wei, how about, uh, you know? Yeah, yes, so. yes. Uh, I think that's a, a great question. Uh, I don't think that's a new phenomenon because uh, uh, even for old technology like internet, like uh, uh, satellites, uh, there was a very big and significant global digital divide. Uh, so in the era of uh, AI technology, I think we can just uh, see the same global digital divide in the new uh, media technology era. Uh, I think maybe there are uh, three solutions for this new uh, global intelligence um, uh, technology divide. Uh, the first one, I think, is probably through uh, the international organization, uh, through something like uh, the, the United Nations or something like uh, the forum we're having right now. Uh, so maybe uh, if we can uh, reach a consensus about how uh, this international organization can do something uh, to reduce this kind of uh, global digital divide, I think that would be a very good solution. And the second one would be uh, the country, uh, the uh, multilateral uh, cl collaboration between different countries, uh, especially uh, those uh, more developed countries, if they can uh, supply uh, some uh, technologies and they can supply some uh, 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 human resources to help those underdeveloped countries to uh, to catch up, I think maybe uh, those uh, developing countries they can uh, have a better performance in terms of this uh, uh, AI technology uh, development. Uh, so uh, finally, I think maybe for those uh, uh, poorer countries or for those uh, underdeveloped uh, development countries, they should uh, make uh, more investment investments in both. Uh, uh, those uh, hardware and also software, especially uh, by increase uh, the education uh, around this new technology uh, area, uh, maybe they can uh, do a good job in uh, reducing the global digital divide. So that's my uh, ideas. Thank you very much, Professor Wei. I hope this helped to Jose. I really um, share this um, concept there and the United Nations can play a very important role in facilitate and you know serious discussion about this and the conversation. That's why we're here at IGF, right? So anyone else and you know please jump in and you want to you know discuss this and even from audiences we have standing mic there. Um, let us know and your 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 questions there. Any other questions yeah. from the audiences from online? I mean yeah, Professor Shama. Uh, no, uh, Dr. Zhang, can I just uh, chime in to, uh, in response to that question? Uh, I I I agree. There there is a divide. I just want to highlight also that while there can there will be a divide between developed and underdeveloped country or developing nations, but I think that within nations also there will be a divide between the developed areas and the ones that are not at par. Um, uh, in in some of these cases also, I think what's going to be driven, what's going to drive the divide is the development of markets. Uh, how how markets are better connected in some areas versus other areas, um, supply chains, for instance, where uh, AI is going to be far more useful. In some cases, where um, it's almost going to be a necessity uh, or will fill a huge gap. And then finally, the last thing I want to mention is again that goes to the divide: urban, rural, developed, developing is education. And and I think Dr. Wei mentioned that as well. So just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Shama. Any other comments on this? I would love to uh, you know, remind everybody, AI questions not so easy to handle. Uh, I really appreciate some serious discussion about the uh, pros and cons and the benefits and the setbacks AI may cost us. It's not always good and not always bad. Yeah, um, those people on the site and uh, any question or on the internet and with us here, you know, have any questions, discussions? Yeah. You know, we have a we have a couple of um, you know speaker did not show up today, and uh, you know because of different reasons. Here, yeah. um, Dr. Zhang, can I ask a question? Please. Um, one of the things that we looked at in our paper on, on ethics and, and morality was that uh, is can can we can we define 
uh, is there a one single definition of how we define ethical questions and, and moral uh, ideas? And I wanted to ask the panelists and, and my colleagues and, and others in the room, that what is their experience uh, as they have interacted with uh, other international scholars that is, you know, what, what makes the difference in actually defining questions around ethics and morality? That's a very good question. You know, anyone can jump in and uh, Renat and Lola and, uh, you know, anyone on, online or on the site can jump in before I can talk. I think this is a very good question, uh, you know, Professor Sharma. I, I do appreciate this. Actually, as society develops their own human machine partnership, I believe and the cultural difference, you know, also play a role too. Um, could in potentially an incompatible operationally or moral limits and with, with respect to AI. So um, there's, a, you know, this is a definitely the new genre. It was AI is obviously taking us to the space so we no longer constrained by the limit of established human knowledge. So there's definitely some new challenges and, you know, ahead of us. What's bothered me so much is like, and how could we answer the question who teach the ethics to those machines? And increasingly, and when machines make mistakes, we cannot hold them accountable for the mistakes they make. Like auto car have a, like a crash and, you know, have an you know, incident on the highway. We cannot blame that's Tesla's problem. That's like, you know, someone else's problem. And we need and to take control of our life back instead of like, and, you know, AI just drive us you know, to somewhere we, we have never been before. Yeah. Yeah, can I um, add a little bit more to, towards that? So I think even before AI, we have this argument of what decide what is ethical and what is not. And sometimes it also goes back to something more philosophical. Like, do we believe if we weigh the um, bad, um, the good outcomes comparing to the potential risk we can harm, we can cause to human, uh, will that justify our decision to do this thing, especially with AI? For example, if we collect person's private uh, health information, but we can create a model that better help predict their cardiovascular disease risk, is that something we need to do? Because we kind of invade people's privacy and freedom in terms of data um, collection and usage, but on the other hand, we also create this model for them to help them better um, achieve health outcomes in their life. So we always have this kind of argument. Do we always weigh um, the potential risk against the potential good that we're going to do with AI? And also, some people may argue that even though you have some good intention and good outcomes out of your AI usage, you will still cause some harms, and we should not do that at all. And people in that uh, stream of research, they will argue that uh, we're going to stick with rules. So in the society, we're just going to make a bunch of rules regarding AI usage, and then we're all going to follow those rules, no matter what different outcomes we will have with our AI. So I think it's still a very important and controversial, in a sense, question for us to think about um, in a world with AI, as whether we want to follow rules for our um, actions, or do we want to be more relativism in terms of deciding what is good um, in terms of outcomes and how should we weight that against the potential harm that we're going to cause. Yes. Thank you, Lola. You know, I really appreciate it. I do see like, you know, on the side and someone will try to approach our standing mic and please do, you know, uh, thank you very much. We can hear you. I hope. Thank you. Uh, to the same question, I actually wanted to uh, put my thoughts there. My name is Asim. Uh, when we talk about the ethics, we have to first go into the core that how the ethics are derived. So ethics are the core values which come either from the society, culture, or religion. There are some basis of ethics. So even while addressing the AI ethics, we have to see that we can put these ethics into two big uh, containers, I, I might say. Uh, one container can be that there are universal ethics, which are universally, globally adopted by all the societies and cultures. And then there are regional uh, ethics, 
so uh, i think we have to first figure out that which are those and then we have to feed them to some ai thank you very good thank you i really i mean, appreciate the metaphor you use the two containers let's kind of keep those two containers in mind and you know when we approach ai um how we how are we going to balance that and uh, maybe like uh, we have even multiple containers um you know not just uh, you know universal accepted rules things here and something new we never know before um as as we know that the ubiquity of ai is so extremely pervasive in our societies right now uh, i really appreciate that kind of metaphors containers um thank you any comments from the panel from um Dr. Zhang, audience. I think uh, Renata has her hand up and then yeah, I just I'll make a comment after that. Okay, good, good. I had a comment, but it wasn't like about this conversation. It was gonna be like another question. So if you need to finish uh, this topic, I can just jump in later. I'll just make a very quick comment. I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Asim's uh, uh, comment. I just wanna point out actually what Renata said earlier if AI is being driven by efficiencies, uh, which I, you know, I pointed out as well. Um, and then could there be this, uh, as you know, just reference to the containers of, uh, um, could, could there be a drive from, let's say the larger companies, which have a, a, a greater advantage or greater sort of um, benefit out of um, AI. So uh, while I absolutely agree that there are these universal ideas, I think the universal ideas can also be biased by the bigger players that have a greater benefit to derive out of uh, these technologies. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to follow up very quickly since we have time a little bit. Uh, last year, we proposed a new model called FAT model to talk about uh, the AI acceptance. And you know, we're talking about the user experience. F means and uh, fairness and A means accountability. And the T is transparency, as you know. But this year, you know what? And we're going to write a new paper and really propose an FEAT model, FEAT model. E, actually, you know, you know, and we were talking about ethical dimensions about that. We're working on this, and you know, we'll we'll love to share, you know, immediately with the community uh, as as long as we get it published somewhere. So any other questions while well, we were discuss AI ethics for those people who just come us and you know, we will discuss AI ethics and the internet governance and the global experience here. Any other question you, you wanna jump in? Yeah, um, so like my question was, I feel like it's more related to Lola's speech because like her speech actually reminded me of like the news that came like around October about like the Facebook files, about like how the algorithm was like kind of like proposedly like pushing like body ideas to like young teenagers and like Facebook knew about it and it was part of the algorithm. So like, this is not something that it's like illegal, but I feel like it's morally wrong. So like in a situation like this where they're proposedly like pushing like content through the algorithm that it's proposedly making like people feel like bad about the word is cre like creating um, how issues like how to do these situations like this? Yeah, anyone can 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 talk about that. Um, you know, this is like a very interesting. You know, for many years, it's difficult about the AI and AI ethics. It's not of decision making happened behind those algorithms we're using were not transparent or we we lack knowledge to understand and how those things were opening up well i just want to report to you and you know in the united states you know there's some new uh, trend i just noticed like that you know for example um youtube said and the public no longer could watch like an anyone younger than 18's recorded video you are not automatically add to the youtube all right, TikTok, you know, in the United States will say it will stop sending app notification to teenager at night in the evening. And Facebook and Google have sharply restricted the way that advertisers can trailer message to minors on Google, in both Google and, you know, things there. So suddenly all the big tech companies and sort of began to protect kids there now. I believe that's come from the pressure of us, the civil you know, society is really holds them accountable 
like moments ago, Renata were mentioning about that Facebook file and the Congress hearing and what happening in the, in the United States. I don't think that's enough though. You, we cannot read our um, big tech, just do their own things. Oh, we'll protect kids, we'll protect you know, people. I like and, you know, civil society and other stakeholders and get on this topic. Like what we, like an IGF organizes, you know, AI ethics discussion about and hold them accountable and improve our own AI literacy, you know, regarding how we can detect those and, you know, harms, you know, benefits, you know, could come to us. Okay, we have five or more minutes, you know, yeah, uh, Lola, yeah, please. Yeah, can I just add a little bit on that? So I, I completely agree with what Dr. Jones just said about like, it's not just the company's um, responsibility to prevent things like that happen from happening again. And on the one hand, we need more regulations on tech companies to uh, show us how they decide what to put in their algorithm and what they decided not to. So be more transparent in the way they're using data so that we can know what helps them make their decisions. And on the other hand, we also think we as users and as scholars, we need to, uh, I think Dr. Wei talked about this in his speech, um, is about to have more media literacy interventions so that people will know more about how social media work and how we can use different tools to protect us um, during the social media use. And I think a lot of companies like Dr. Jung just said are ahead of others in dealing with this kind of issue. So I specifically research and work with eating disorder patients. So if you search eating disorder on TikTok um, today that you won't be able to see any content. So it will directly lead you to the National Organ Association of Eating Disorders and an NIH page on eating disorder. But other companies are a, a little bit slow and behind that. So if you search on YouTube, Twitter or Instagram, you will still be able to see those contents. But I think that is a really good step for TikTok to take. And that is something all tech companies should be looking up to and uh, incorporate that into their social media uh, strategies and algorithm in the future. Yes. Thank you, Lola. You know, I really appreciate this. And, you know, so far, and we don't have like, big tech issues. And I'm, I'm, I really appreciate that. And I can provide this platform for us. For those people on the on site there, and, you know, our standing mic is over there. And anyone want to jump, uh, jump in, join us and for some discussion? We have a few minutes and reserved for you folks here. Please, thank you. Anyone? you know, on this other on side, all right? How about us? I and mean, you know, each of us and me give a um, wrapping up like a sentence to wrap up today's and a wonderful discussion about AI. I, I like to thank and IGF again for this uh, opportunity. Anyone want to like just give one sentence or two uh, wrap up? How about we go to uh, Renata first? You know, you guys didn't ask to talk, now maybe you go first and then we, we wrap it up. Yeah, well, thank you so much for the discussion because I definitely learned um, a lot about like topics that I wasn't really familiar about. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to say um, thank you for the invite and it was great. <laughs> thank you. Okay, and then we go to how about to Lola then? Uh, and it is a great honor to be here and I learned a lot from all of our speakers and I think we're discussing something, something that is really important in our society nowadays and I hope uh, beyond this um, panel, beyond our discussion today, we'll have more um, discussion outside the panel and to push forward uh, more ethical research on artificial intelligence. Yes. Okay, and then next we go to uh, Professor Shama. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Zhang. Um, we got to keep talking about this, more uh, awareness, more education. We got to keep asking more questions. So these kind of discussions are very relevant and timely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Professor Fang, uh, I think that's a good way, and the, and the Professor Fang said we did not attend, uh, you know, uh, in-person IGF for two years now. We really want to jump back. Me too. I really share that. And the Professor Wei. Professor Wei. Yeah, uh, oh, no, I, I missed him. 
I want to just jump in very quickly or mentioning like, and you know, AI were suggesting some new solutions and directions that were bear, bear the stamp of any other non-human from learning and logic evolution. So I, I like kind of we focus not just on harms or not just on benefits of AI. We want to take AI like, and you know, uh, co coherently. Uh, I don't think that's just uh, any technology will just bring us benefits or just bring us harms. You know, it's there's a lot of things and the work going on. But indeed, AI is not like any other technology, like machine learnings, because they are devising some solutions seems beyond the scope of human imagination, which is very amazing. You know, AI, AI and you know, age is coming to us. I think that's uh, you know fantastic there. Actually, you know what? We almost hit down here now. Christiane, and you know, you just join in and you have anything to talk to us. You can unmute yourself, please. Go ahead. Christian Nisi. Okay. We cannot hear you. Sorry, Sounds Dr. John. I was disconnected. All right, that's fine. All right, how about and do we, and you, you know, you, you give us a yeah, uh, uh, right yeah, words. So I'm just that uh, he has a right support. Okay. Go ahead. I think that's a great panel. Uh, I think uh, uh, AI ethics and internet governance is a very complex issue and it's a very big social system. Uh, I think uh, we, we, we need everybody take part in this uh, great uh, process. Uh, the government, the big company, uh, media organizations, international organizations, and most importantly, uh, the general public, the, the individuals, everybody, including us, we need to play a role in this process. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Professor Wei. Christian, and your turn again. We want to have everybody listen to you and before we wrap it up, can you uh, talk to us and you have some words there? I looks like a, a little bit frozen to me. I, I don't know uh, on your side. You, yeah, yeah, you, you're good there. Uh, again, unmute yourself, please. Christian Nisi. Yes, can you hear me? And we, have, we can hear you now, you know, yeah. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as I was saying, I, uh, I'm i just there to provide technical support for the session. So. I don't have much to say as I okay. I'd listen to the conversation about good. It good. And AI. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate this. Um I, I do think this is a wonderful uh, you know start of the conversation uh, about this. We definitely need more. I hope next year, you know, we'll meet in person and then we'll shake hands and hugs and you know, and do do want like a you know, even on-site food is not always good, but you know, uh, that's not the most important part of the IGF. I uh, hope and we'll meet and in person next year. All right. I particularly thank those people who come and to the conference uh, for and uh, you know attending this. I appreciate and you know your participation. I hope like and you know we all learn from each other through the platform of IGF. Okay. Good morning. Good evening. Good like um, noon and have lunch. Uh, good lunch together. Um, all those things here and I wish to see you everybody next year. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.